The Forage Feast is a purveyor of specialty produce. You know, me and my guys, we're a group of hobbits at this point because that's the only thing we could possibly be, these mushroom-loving, hairy-toed, forest-dwelling creatures. Yep. There they go. We do a lot of mushrooms, a lot of wild mushrooms, wild greens. Foraging is about getting what you need. In most cases, it's the most nutrient-rich, most dense, powerful, definitely connected food you can have. Most of the food you buy in the supermarket has so little nutrition. The stuff you get when you walk through the forest is just packed with goodness. The bulk of our business is the mushrooms. We do a lot of cultivated mushrooms in addition to all of the wild mushrooms that we do. This is oak and for shiitakes, oak is the primary wood. So we're looking to make holes about six inches apart. And the quicker it can colonize the log, the safer, the better it is. You don't get contamination from some other kind of mushroom trying to grow in on your shiitake logs. So here we've got the, um, the sawdust spawn that we're gonna inoculate our shiitake logs with today. It's got all of this mushroom mycelia growing throughout it. These logs will turn into shiitakes for three to five years from the time we inoculate them. We use our inoculation tool. It's jammed up with all of the material. You put it over one of the holes and then you just plunge it in there. Now we have a tub here of molten hot paraffin wax. So this is just simple paraffin wax and we just take it on these daubers and that's gonna seal off each of these holes. This mushroom spawn, if you just left it out, there are plenty of animals and birds and things who would find it pretty attractive. It's kind of a nutrient rich source. So you've got to seal it. It also keeps the moisture in the log. And the other thing that we got to do is we need to mark our log. We mark them with the initials of the strain that we're using and the year. So these are going to go off into the vehicle here because we'll take them off to our laying yard. So here we are at, at the laying yard. So what we've got here is a whole bunch of our logs that are in their sort of winter and dormant phase. These logs here represent a bunch of different years, but for right now, we're gonna stack up our, our new set and we're gonna start with the biggest logs. You wanna grab the other end of this one? All of the inoculant we just put in is now gonna start feeding on this wood. It's gonna start spreading its mycelial network. They're not gonna produce mushrooms this year the way all of these will. These will sit till next spring, basically, in this position, we won't touch them. And then we'll come back here later in May and June and start harvesting. There's so many mushrooms in the world. Worldwide, they probably outnumber plants. I don't know the actual number in New Jersey. As far as edible mushrooms in New Jersey, I myself have picked over 60 varieties. Let's go up into the pines, see if we can find anything good. These are beautiful white oysters. This is a saprophytic mushroom, meaning it's, it's working on killing this tree right now. <laughs> It'll eat the heart right out of it. And they are sweet smelling like sweet briny oysters. The mushrooms, they're the reproductive organ of the fungal body. They wanna grow as fast as they can so that they can spread their spore in the right conditions to seed the next generations. Hear that squeak? That's a good sound. That means it's still firm and solid. That's an oyster cluster. <laughs> this is a good find. We're pleased about this. So these are uh, black velvet boletes or alboters. They're really distinct. They have this beautiful black velvet texture white under the calf. Like seriously, yay. Serious good mushroom. They're like the carpaccio of the mushroom world. They're so hard to find. They are, They're, they really blend in, yeah. The finding of wild mushrooms, it began for me when I, was, when I was still a photographer. So there's one here, and another one back here, and one there. But I'd be blowing the image up really big and be scanning it across the screen, little segments of it, and getting rid of dust. And then I started looking for mushrooms. I've spied a couple of mushrooms way up here. My eyes would be scanning and I realized I was using the exact same muscle. It's, it's a foundational aspect to, to how I became a forager, like, and a good one, right, was the fact that I could see it. 
in a different way. That's fantastic. Oh, it's actually a black staining. Probably the green quilted. There you go, nice big lilac. Oh yeah, that's a winner. Awesome, spotted bolete in perfect condition. Oh, there's a good one. So this is definitely something we're happy to see. That's a nice solid chanterelle. These guys will continue to grow and turn into what we call flowers, chanterelle flowers. They can be the size of your hand like this. The color is amazing. The fragrance is fruity and nutty and delicious. One of our absolute favorites. You don't want to forget a chanterelle patch. We'll add this to the map. Mushrooms are so nutritious. Their protein levels can be off the chart. They also offer all sorts of beneficial compounds, adaptogens and mineral content and other things that are great for your system. They have a lot of antioxidant properties. Cancer fighting benefits, depending on the mushrooms, are being studied constantly right now. And a fungus, it turns out, is a lot more closely related to an animal than it is to a plant. Animals and fungi are close, close cousins. And so the protein structures of mushrooms much more closely mimic that of meat. Big fat lilac. Oh, the stem is enormous. Did you hear that snap? Oh my God, that is in really good shape. So this is basically a porcini. Like this right here, this one mushroom, this is risotto for four. It's crispy. I'm gonna slice this, just listen to the sound. It's like, like a cr really crisp apple in the fall. And it's delicious. It smells like a porcini. That's a special mushroom right there. Foraging, it is gathering these incredible, wonderful resources that we as humans have been eating for millennia. So right here, this tree above us is a black walnut tree. Green briar. There's the stinging nettle plant. This is wood sorrel. We do have berries, Noah. Spice bush? And it's a great breath freshener. Uh -huh. We'll call out to each other in what way works, but some kind of loud yep. might be the way to go. Let's see if we can find Drew, actually. Yep. A wild man appeared. So what we're looking at here is if you look at all of this low green with these little, little white flowers is watercress. Watercress, for those who don't know, is a lot like arugula. So it's got that peppery bite to it, which we love, which chefs tend to love. You know, chefs love big, bold flavors. It's super clean, the pepper. It's like that first hit of a wasabi when it goes in and then is gone, as opposed to like a lingering actual pepper. That watercress we just picked probably has five or seven or 10 times the nutrient value as a bunch of kale. So much of farming became about input equal output, right? But that plant taking from, from the ground here has all of the decay happening around it. All of the fungal life that's causing that decay is fixing different nutrients into the soil in different ways. So yeah, I think it's really important for people to reconnect with that. Oh, these are amanitas. These, this is an absolutely deadly mushroom. This looks like it could be a destroying angel the way it's coming up. We definitely don't want to eat that. It's pretty gross what happens. The destroying angel will make you really sick, vomiting diarrhea for a day, at which point you'll suddenly feel all better for a day. And then all of your organs start to fail. Without immediate medical care, a lot of support, and possibly a liver transplant, if you were to eat a whole destroying angel, there's almost nothing that can be done. It's also important to know what you don't know. If you're not 100%, you, gotta, you really gotta dig back in and make sure it's 100%. Knockwood, I've never made myself sick and been at this a long time. I think it's a good track record for a forager to, uh, to have a healthy respect for where your knowledge is and where it isn't. This yeah. will stain blue, so if we cut it down the middle, you can watch it happen. It's really important to, to be educated. And that's part of why over time, forager's knowledge multiplies because you, it's that peripheral knowledge that you're building while you're looking for the one you're trying to identify in the moment. Drew's the bolete master. He's got boletes on the brain. Oh, Hortonii. Hortonii. Thank you. <laughs> the ability to walk into a forest and look around and see the tree species and the understory species and judge the soil and the rocks. 
It's yellow oyster. Dude. Oh, it is oyster. It's beautiful. We just found our best find of the day, 60 feet in the air. <laughs> We've just had a pretty nice outing for an early season bully hunt. We also got the chanterelles, the oysters, a couple rusulas, and we've lost track of how many bully species. This is going to make a lot of people pretty happy. So what we've got are logs that were watered over a week ago, and they're filled with beautiful shiitakes. These would be an example of of more of a grade A shiitake. Just really beautiful curled, rolled rim, incredible cracking. That's a good mushroom. But we're not super, super fussy all the time about trying to catch them exactly as A grade shiitakes. Where this one, much more mature, has opened up, grown, and flattened. We've found that the flavor, though, is incredible on these big ones. Back at the warehouse, we're gonna unload today's goods and weigh some stuff out. So what we have here is all sorts of mushrooms. That is a chicken of the woods. Just so you can get a sense of the real size, it is a monster and a beautiful, beautiful specimen. Now we've got uh, some beautiful conica morels from the west coast. So morels are a really unusual, they're a ground mushroom, not a tree mushroom. Mycorrhizal, so they grow in, in a symbiotic relationship with trees. The tree passes sugars to the mushroom, the mushroom passes micronutrients to the tree. Neither can synthesize what the other makes by itself. These are coming from Oregon, from the mountainsides where there's been fires. People talk about burn morels. These are the burn morels. One of the things that triggers mushrooms to grow is when their host tree dies, right? So if a forest fire comes along and destroys that forest, then these mushrooms that were growing with the roots of those trees know that they don't have a long time left. When that tree dies, they all send up mushrooms to spread the spores to create the next cycle. Earthy, meaty, rich, a little bit of tobacco, a little bit of sometimes cocoa, a little bit of earth, earth essence. Two of morels, two of the cultivated organic maitake, and then two pounds of chicken. So I would say the chef is gonna be pretty happy when that shows up at his door. So here, we've got a section of, of our dried mushrooms. So things like our wild mix here. We also do things like powders, and this is our chicken bouillon, chicken of the woods. Really delicious. This is our, it's our wild mix. So if I open that up, you look inside, lots of colors, lots of shapes, and I bet you guys are smelling it all of a sudden. All right, a couple of boxes more for Raza. We'll get those to, ready to go in the fridge. Bring on the mushrooms. Yes. Look at those bad boys. These are maitake mushrooms, uh, also called Hen of the Woods. And then your pia pini are up there. I love the texture. Mm -hmm. It's like velvet. It is. Dude, you're the best. Thank you so much. So Dan Richer at Raza is one of those chefs that I first met many, many years ago, and we'd be playing in the ovens and making stuff happen with these incredible mushrooms. And that was the beginning of it. There's different ways you cook different mushrooms. There's different pairings that are perfect. There's different flavors and profiles. There's so much umami in all of the mushrooms that it's triggering that fifth sense of taste. You're out there and your baskets are so overflowing like this is a crazy thing to do for your life. But I don't know what else I could possibly do that would be as much fun. I get to live outdoors most of the time. You know, me and my guys were a group of hobbits at this point because that's the only thing we could possibly be, these mushroom loving, you know, hairy toed, forest dwelling creatures. Like what else are we gonna be?